Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Next Level Logic Models for your ATE proposal and beyond. Today's webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation resource hub for evaluation in the ATE program. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with several other resources. You may also download these resources by following the link on the right-hand side of your screen under Handout. The recording will also be available in a couple of days, and that will be emailed to you. I'm Emma Binder. I'll be the moderator for the webinar today. Lisa wilson betchel will be the main presenter for this webinar. We both work with Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to also recognize our colleagues who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including our amazing Evaluate team. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short, the ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and more. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now I will turn things over to Lissa. Betcho, and I'm excited to spend the next hour with you talking about logic models. But before we begin, I have a few polls with you, so a few polls for you so that we can learn a little bit more about who we have on our webinar today. So the first poll asks, what best describes your role, current or future? So you can answer this poll in the poll tab on the right side of your screen. If it doesn't automatically pop up for you, you can use the tabs at the top and choose the one that says polls. All right, so I see responses coming in. We have about 70% of people who we, we have on today who've responded already. It looks like we have around 40% evaluators, 19%, 20% grant specialists, and 17 and then 14% of PIs or project team members. That's great. So it looks like we have a really good mix of project folks, grant specialists, and evaluators with us today. Some of the strongest logic models are really developed by an interdisciplinary team. So I think that you will all find relevant information in today's webinar. So our second poll is gonna ask you, how are you involved in ATE or NSF? Are you submitting a proposal to ATE? Maybe you're already funded by ATE, or maybe you're not involved in the ATE program or NSF at all. So I'm seeing some responses come in. There's a good number of us on today that are not um, involved in ATE or NSF, but I see some others who are looking at submitting a proposal, about 16% and 20% are already funded. Well, wonderful. So while some of the examples in our webinar today are specifically geared towards NSF ATE programs, the majority of this webinar will be helpful for those in other NSF programs or who are just working on projects funded by other organizations entirely. So thank you all for participating in these polls. We will have more polls and opportunities for interaction throughout today's webinar. We also have multiple question and answer sessions throughout the next hour. So if at any point you have a question, make sure to type it in the chat box and Emma will organize them and hold them until our next question break. For those of you that are in the ATE program, I wanna take a second to share an exciting new opportunity from Evaluate. So the outstanding ATE Evaluation Award will recognize and promote excellence in ATE evaluations. This is a really great way to celebrate the work of our colleagues and our teams. So we really invite PIs, project staffs, evaluators, really anyone in the ATE community to nominate an uh, ATE evaluation that they think is outstanding. This could be of a project, a center, or even a small new to ATE project. So if you're interested in learning more, um, more information can be found at our website. Nominations are due September 10th, 2021, and we look forward to announcing the awards during the upcoming ATEPI conference. All right, so let's jump in today's, into today's content, logic models. So I wanna take a few minutes to review the basics of a logic model. 
So first off, what do we mean when we say a logic model? Well, a logic model is a visual representation of a project's activities and intended outcomes. Think of logic models as tools for you to express your project's intentions and underlying assumptions. What are you planning on doing and what difference will that bring about? In many ways, a logic model can be a map to your project. It communicates what your project will do, how you're gonna do it, and what you want to accomplish. So let's look at the basic components of a logic model. I call these basic because logic models can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So we'll talk about those additional elements in a second. Logic models typically consist of columns with some of the following labels. Activities, short-term outcomes, mid-term outcomes, and long-term outcomes. So let's look at all of these a little bit closer. So activities are intended to capture the actions taken by your project to bring about the intended outcomes. This column answers the question, what did we do or what are we planning on doing? So for ETE projects, some examples might include developing a new curriculum, holding a summer transition program for high school students, or offering professional development to educators. Short-term outcomes are intended to capture change that result directly from those activities. So this column answers the question, what will the target audience know or be able to do because of the project? Midterm outcomes are the changes that result from those short-term outcomes. So this column answers the question, what are the next anticipated changes in the target audience because of the short-term outcomes that we just saw? So there is no set time frame that differentiates short-term from midterm outcomes. It really depends on the project time frame and how long you'd expect to wait to see the next logical outcome to appear. Because this timing differs across projects and logic models, it may be a good idea to label your logic model columns. So would you expect to see these outcomes two weeks after your project activity, two months, or maybe even two years? So for short-term and midterm outcomes, it can be really helpful to think about changes in knowledge, skills, ability, or behavior for your target audience. So who did your activities serve and what immediate change would you expect to see after their participation? Some examples for an ETE project might be the implementation of a new curriculum, increased knowledge in students, or change in skills for educators. Long-term outcomes are changes that result from those short and midterm outcomes. So these outcomes are related back to the initial need for the project. Long-term outcomes can be at the individual level, or they can capture the change that impacts systems, institutions, and communities resulting from those project outcomes. This column answers the question, what is the larger impact of the project? Long-term outcomes are not always feasible to measure or really capture through your evaluation. These impacts may be years away from the initial activity, or they just might be too difficult to accurately measure sometimes. Examples of long-term outcomes for ATE projects might include things like increased graduation rate for students, increased employment in STEM fields, or fulfilling workforce needs. So the activities column communicates what your project does, while the outcomes column communicates what changes you will bring about. What are the consequences or impacts of your project activities? Logic models bring to the surface the underlying assumptions or theories that connect a project activities to their intended impact. There's an if-then or causal relationship between the components of this model. If you do act this activity, then you will get this outcome. If you see this short-term outcome, then you will see this midterm outcome. So these logical links between the columns are, are what represent our thinking of how a project works, kind of like our internal project theory. So I briefly mentioned earlier that there's no single standard format for when it comes to logic models. The most important thing is that it clearly communicates your project's intentions and impacts. But let's look at some ways logic models might differ. So in this mock-up that you see here, you can see that they use individual boxes and arrows between the different columns. Arrows can be really helpful when you wanna be specific about the logical or causal links between different elements. However, some choose just to list elements in a column without the use of arrows at all. 
Other column titles that we see frequently include things like inputs or outputs. So inputs capture the resources that are invested into a project. This column answers the question, what resources made this project possible? Inputs might include things like funding, personnel time, existing infrastructure, or even technology. So documenting those needed inputs can help in project replication, and they can also help in assessing the feasibility and context that's required to successfully carry out project activities. Outputs capture the direct, immediate, and tangible products that result from project activities. So this column answers the question, what was produced by the activities? So outputs and outcomes are some of the most confounded concepts in developing logic models. So if you decide to include outputs in your logic model, focus on tangible deliverables as opposed to more elusive changes that happen within people. So for ATE project examples, examples of outputs might include, say, the, the written curriculum development or even number of students that attended a program. So additional elements that I've also seen included in logic models include a problem statement. So including a problem statement gives an opportunity to clearly outline the problem or the need of project activities and what they intend to address. System influences or external factors, I've also seen it called. So more and more we're recognizing that our projects and interventions happen within a larger system and context. We rarely have control over all of the elements that will influence our intended outcomes. Acknowledging these system level influences on your logic model places your project within that larger context. Assumptions. So while a logic model is intended to capture those underlying assumptions of your project, sometimes it can be more straightforward to actually write out those assumptions that your team is making. So what beliefs do you have about how or why the project will work? This might include the assumption that people will authentically engage and participate with the project activities, or even that the project will have low faculty turnover. So for those of you who are interested in creating your own logic model or just want a place to start, we do have a logic model template for ATE projects on our website. So you can download the template as a PowerPoint file and you can actually add your project specifics directly into those boxes. So these are only some examples of the different elements that we've seen included in logic models. I do want to share with you some different examples um, of logic models just to give you a sense of the different formats that they can come in. So these will be available in our slide handout. So for now, just focus on the overall format and the presentation of the information rather than the details. So here's an example that utilizes a fairly straightforward approach using those, those columns. So they don't use arrows. Instead, they keep their elements organized using bullet points. They've included a vision statement on top, along with columns for resources and strategies as well. So here's another logic model example, very different from the column approach. So they make use of different color boxes and arrows to really demonstrate that connection between project elements. This example includes a problem statement, goals, rationales, and assumptions. And then they directly connect their long-term outcomes back to the initial goal, demonstrating how their project intends to fill that initial need. So kind of bringing things full circle. So here's another example that begins to explore the winding connection between activities and outcomes. So they've broken that traditional mode of columns and starting to use a more artistic approach to visualize their logic model. So all of these examples to say, logic models can look very different. Um, and the most important part is the fact that you are clarifying your project activities and intended outcomes. So that was a lot of information. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna hand it over to Emma to facilitate some questions. Thank you so much, Lissa. So we did get a question from Dahlia and we've had a couple responses in the chat. Um, but the, her question was, is there a software recommended to create a logic model? Uh, so we did have one response in from Kirk that said Lucid Charts, but I was curious if you had any additional ideas or recommendations. Um, I think that there are so many new uh, 
what are they called, like mind mapping softwares or digital whiteboards out there that are really great for creating logic models, especially if you want to work with a diverse team and maybe you're still virtual. It's a place that everyone can really look at things at once and move things around. So I've heard of Lucid Charts as one. I think even if you just search mind mapping, but the digital whiteboards I use as well are Miro. Um, I love Mural is another one. And I think Google has one called Jamboard, I believe. Um, but to be honest, you don't need any of those fancy softwares, right? I think one of you know the traditional ways of doing it is just lots and lots of sticky notes and people in a room. Um, and then when it comes to actually capturing your logic model, I find that PowerPoint is a little bit easier just because you can have boxes and move them around, but Word, Microsoft Word works just as well. Thank you, Alyssa. And it looks like a few folks uh, on here uh, from the of webinar course. are putting in some ideas. So make sure to keep watching that chat box. It looks like uh, Alice also agrees with Miro. And then Erica actually said that she uses Visio, which is a Microsoft product. Um, so great suggestions from everyone. Keep those coming. Thanks, Lissa. Uh, it looks like we've got another question that came in from Peggy. Uh, we stated that you stated the difference between outputs and outcomes, but only defined outputs. Can you share a direct example of the differences between these two? Thanks for asking that, Peg, that question, Peggy. I think, I think that particularly when you're first starting off with logic models, the difference between those outputs and outcomes can be really tough, especially because they're named so similarly, right? So outputs are really the tangible deliverables, things that happen as, um, a, uh, I'm gonna say a direct consequence of the activities. But so for example, if your activity is developing a program curriculum, the output is the actual curriculum. So it's the actual Microsoft Word file, or if you're gonna print it out, it's the actual paper, it's the actual document that has the curriculum. Um, but the out, outcome from that would be using that curriculum, right? So whatever action that someone is taking as a result of that. And then with outcomes, we have them differentiated in between short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And the difference between those is really about length of time, as well as logical flow and connection from one to the other. Awesome. Thank you, Lissa. And keep the questions coming in for Lissa uh, if you have others. It looks like Christy submitted a question. She said, in leading logic model development collaborati collaboratively in a virtual environment, what have you found works well to lead people through the process, especially those who have never worked with logic models before and or a new to the concept? Such a great question. So, you know, in pre-COVID, I feel like logic model development very typically looked like people sitting around a table with a large whiteboard and a lot of sticky notes. Um, but as we are working from home and working virtually, I think that those softwares that we mentioned earlier, something like Miro or Jamboard, is really interesting because it has the opportunity for multiple people to actually interact in the same space at the same time. So people can be creating digital sticky notes and commenting on those sticky notes. So I think in terms of a, a software to help facilitate that, those kinds of things are very helpful. But I still think that the facilitation process itself generally stays the same, right? It's about asking important questions, asking more questions, really getting down to that why, really understanding the internal logic of what's happening behind a program and what you can expect to happen next. All right, another question came in from Shannon. Do any of your formal or informal studies show a connection between organizations using logic models and having a strong buy-in satisfaction or ethical cultures? That is such an interesting question, Sharon. Shannon. I don't think that we have um, specific studies, at least not from Evaluate or not that I'm aware of, that shows that connection directly. We have recently looked at um, a number of years of ATE proposals and the evaluation plans that are in there. And we have seen an increased use of logic models within ATE proposals. Um, I think that there is a general sense that there is stronger buy-in, there's more communication, there's a, a better 
shared understanding of the project's intention and impact, um, all things that we're going to continue to talk about this in the next hour. But I love the idea of looking at a really formal study that actually shows that and gives some harder evidence behind that. All right, well, those are the questions we had coming in. Again, if you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to drop those in the chat box. We do have, uh, I believe, two more question breaks coming up. So before we get moving uh, back to Lissa, I do have a quick announcement. If you have any additional questions about logic models or any aspect of evaluation, we encourage you to connect with a coach today. Coaching services are free to all ATE members and those applying to ATE. No question is too small to chat with one of our coaches. AT evaluation coaches can work with you to develop a logic model or get your evaluation plan ready for submission. So with that, I will turn things over to Lissa. Anna put the uh, URL for coaching services in our uh, chat box. So back to you, Lissa, for the webinar. All right, so now that we are all on the same page with what a logic model is, let's talk about using logic models. So I've mentioned a few times that a logic model is a tool. In many ways, it's a Swiss army knife of tools. A logic model can have multiple uses for different audiences. Logic models can help when you're planning project activities, help at the proposal writing stage. They can be used to structure and guide your evaluation planning, and even for project management and reflection. Before we dive into some of those uses, I do have a chat question for you. So for those of you who have some experience working with logic models before, do you start developing your logic model from the activities column or do you start from the outcomes column? So I wanna hear from you. Use, go ahead and use the chat box on the right side of your screen to respond. So I'm seeing a number of people say outcomes, some say activities. I see some saying both too, which is interesting. Sometimes both. Kirk says wherever the client is focused. Yes, Amanda says working backwards can work best. It depends. Alice, that's I think one of my favorite <laughs> responses and evaluation, right? It's all context dependent. Depends on the ideas to start. Yeah. So, you know, I, I completely agree with what a lot of you are saying that there really is no right or wrong response to this question. I have successfully created logic models from both directions, starting from the activities column and starting from the outcomes column. Um, and most times it's actually a bit of both, right? So developing a logic model can be a really iter iterative process. And so you might work on some of the activities and then some of the outcomes, and then you might return to the activities. So I, I've never seen a successful logic model created in a single draft before. So uh, normally there are multiple rounds with lots of different discussions. So thank you so much for answering that question. It's really interesting. So let's talk about using logic models for project planning. So if you're in this project planning phase, it might be helpful to use a logic model to frame your planning discussions in order to ensure that the proposed activities really match the intended outcomes. So here's an example where you might want to look at starting from the long-term outcomes column. So by starting here, you can build consensus and understanding about that big picture impact of your project. What's your end destination? This can then help align your team to a shared mission. Then you can ask your team about how these outcomes might be achieved and working backwards through the various outcomes until you arrive at the project activities. So using a logic model to frame those types of planning and brainstorming discussions, they can help you to ensure a logical connection between each piece of your project. It also allows you to really closely examine any logical gaps or missing activities that you might have. So project planning can involve a diverse team of players. A valuable benefit of developing a logic model is to really build a shared understanding across the entire team and promote consensus. So it can be helpful to have multiple perspectives from the project team, including the insights from those leading the project, as well as those implementing the project, as well as from your evaluator. So evaluators can bring a really critical lens to the project planning and logic model modeling process. Um, and so they really take into consideration that internal project logic, but also ensure that identified outcomes are measurable and that they're realistic. And finally, grant specialists have a lot of experience and skills in this area as well. 
So sometimes it can take someone external to your team to help clarify um, and look at those internal assumptions. So we were talking about before that generally these planning process involve lots and lots and lots of sticky notes. But especially in times of COVID, more and more folks are using digital whiteboards to brainstorm and develop logic models with virtual groups. So as I mentioned earlier, some of our favorite digital whiteboards to check out are Miro, Google Jamboard, or Mural. So just as logic models can help create consensus among your project team, a logic model can be a really great way to distill and communicate your project's intention to proposal reviewers. So for the National Science Foundation, nearly all programs are asked for a project description that's limited to about 15 pages. So those 15 pages may seem like a lot at first, but you'll quickly find yourself tight on space. So here are thumbnails of Evaluate's last NSF proposal. And I know you can't read any of these pages in detail, but I just want to give you a sense of how dense a 15 page project description can feel. And show you that here on page 11, we took almost a full page to display our logic model. So a well crafted logic model can be a focal point for reviewers. It can really help them to distill the different narrative sections of your project description down into an overview of your project activities and outcomes. So we know it can feel difficult to squeeze that logic model into your 15 page project description. However, we really do recommend that you include it in that description and not in the supplementary documents. So NSF reviewers are not required to read supplementary documents and all of your work that you put into that logic model might go overlooked by reviewers. Your logic model might also help you structure the narrative in your project description. So you might decide to include a section titled project activities, and then you can include the primary activities from your logic model, even as headings in that section. Your short-term and midterm outcomes, they might translate into goals or objectives for your project. And while most things in ATE projects translates into broader impacts, you, might, you definitely wanna pay attention to how your long-term outcomes in your logic model maps onto the broader impacts that you discuss in your ATE proposal. All right, so before looking at logic models for proposal, uh, now that we've looked at using logic models for proposal writing, I have another chat question for you. So this question actually came from a web chat that we had last week and it sparked really good conversation. So I wanted to use it again here. So for evaluators or grant specialists that are on today, what do you want project staff to have prepared or be ready to answer when you meet with them to develop a logic model? So I'll give you a second to think about that question because I think it's I think it's a hard one, but I think it's a helpful one for for PIs and project staffs. So Sam says goals and objectives. Benjamin says what they want to accomplish and how. I see a lot of goals. David says, what are your intended outcomes? Ooh, Susan, I like the why of the proposal, activities if known. That's such a great way of, of saying it, the why of the proposal. So why are you doing and what are you doing? I've seen a lot of people talk about activities. I know it seems pretty straightforward and simple to have a grasp of all the activities, but as an evaluator, I actually frequently find that I go into conversations with clients and they're actually not quite clear within themselves about what their activities are. So I think that that's a really helpful response as well. Kim really says purpose of what they're doing and a need. Katie says audience. I think that's a great response too. So for, for PIs and project staff that are on board, I hope you take some time to read through these responses from evaluators and grant specialists. So if you're preparing for a meeting, where you're going to talk about logic models. These are great. Thank you all for your insight and responses. You know, so many times I find that the chat box is one of the most valuable pieces of our webinar. So thank you. So if you're interested in learning more about writing proposals, Evaluate does have two prior webinars that are specifically about ATE proposals, how to integrate your evaluation and avoiding some common pitfalls um, about writing an evaluation plan. But I'm sure that there have been additional questions in the chat. So let's take a second and answer some of those questions. So absolutely, Lisa, we had some good ones come in. So the first one is, 
Let me pop that up for you. What is the difference between a logic model and a logical framework log frame? Can we use both in the same proposal? A logic model we've talked about, a logical framework or the term log frame typically comes in the context of international development projects. So organizations like USAID or the UN will typically require a log frame. And so earlier when I was talking about, I, I view logic models as kind of this overarching uh, umbrella term, and a log frame is a specific type of logic model. So when we were talking about the different elements that a logic model can contain, log frames tend to contain really specific column titles. So I would always make sure that you are looking at the requirements from the funder, because some can be very specific about what they want you to include in a proposal. So if they ask for a log frame, make sure that you're looking at what column titles they're asking for and if they're requiring any of those. Um, because this is about NSF ATE, the ATE program does not require a logic model to be included in a proposal. However, we at Evaluate highly encourage it. And there are no required columns or specific format. I think going back to that idea of a logic model as a tool and doing anything that really helps you clearly distill and communicate your project purpose and impact. Thanks for the answer, Lissa. Uh, so the next one is from Rebecca. She asked, how detailed should logic models get? Since project goals and direction shift in the field, they would need to be updated. So it is a lot of detail. Is, so it's a lot Rebecca, of detail. This is like the it. never ending question that you always go back and forth about, right? Even when I'm developing logic models with clients, I always go back and forth with myself of, is it worth it to be more detailed? And so I think really being clear about why you're making a logic model and how you intend to use it would be how I would go about responding to this. So for example, if your primary use of the logic model was to include in a funding proposal, I would probably lean on the side of being a little less detailed, mainly because 15 pages is not a lot of space and you gotta squeeze your logic model to get in there. But if your main intention for using a logic model is really to organize your evaluation, or to do some project management, that actually being more detailed as that internal document might be more helpful. All right, here's one, Lisa, you knew it was coming. Irene, uh, we asked, what is the difference between logic model and theory Irina, of change? thank you so much for asking this action. question. Emma was joking because I just yesterday said, oh, I didn't include this because someone will, I know someone will ask about it. Um, so the difference between a logic model and theory of change, um, you know, I think people use these terms differently. So I think anytime you are looking at or you're reading something or someone's referring to one or the other, ask them to define what they mean by those two things. But um, a logic model tends to be a little bit more specific, a little bit more concrete, um, a little bit more linear and in boxes. So if you're looking at that visual format of a logic model, a theory of change really is about documenting that underlying project theory. So how do you think this will happen and why do you think it will happen? So theories of change sometimes can get a little bit more in depth about those logical links that we were talking about before. So really making sure that you have justification and backing to why you think these things will happen. It, they also can tend to be a little bit less linear, um, a little bit more uh, creative when it comes to the format of them, but that's just what I've seen in tendency. And then a theory of action, I've heard the term used, but I have to say I do not have a specific definition for that. So again, I would say wherever you're seeing that term theory of action used, make sure that you're going back and asking them exactly what they're asking for. I think that's a really good point, Liz. I'll always check with your funder. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we had one more question that came in from Dahlia. Is the logic model yes. useful Short answer, after yes. a grant I is think, awarded? And we will talk about this more, but I think a lot of times um, people place a lot of emphasis on creating logic models up front, 
But I think there's also a lot of use and a lot of reward to revisiting your logic model, using it for evaluation management, using it for project management as a way that really captures your entire project on a single page and lets you reflect back and say, we said we were going to do this activity. Did we do it? We said we anticipated this outcome. Did it happen? And why or why not? It really gives you a way to structure those kinds of internal reflection discussions around your team to understand what's going well, what's not going so well, and really what's happening. We do. Yeah, right. And then we have one more question that came through from Benjamin. He asked, do you have data or a feel for actually how many so our evaluate just finished model. up a research study that looked at, I believe it was 10 years of ATE proposals. Um, and I'm actually going to ask Emma or Anna to dig up a link to those preliminary findings because I don't have all that information off the top of my head, but we are really excited to start releasing some information, some findings from that study. We have also submitted a full manuscript that really talks about the, the details of that and what that trend looks like across time. But um, in short, it is certainly increasing over time. However, um, I don't think that they it, that percent of ATE proposals is as high as at least I would like to see it. So I hope that more people really use logic models in their proposals. And I just dropped the link in the chat for that. So if anyone's interested in following up on that study that Lissa just mentioned about changes in ATE proposals across time, the link is in the chat box. So I believe that is the end of our questions uh, for this round. We'll, we'll have one more round of questions for Lisa. So do make sure to keep putting your questions in the chat box. If you have additional questions about the webinar material, we encourage you to join us on our Evaluate Slack community. The Slack community is a great place to meet new evaluation community members. So we encourage you to go out to our website and join, or if you have already joined and are a member, to come out and chat with us Wonderful. after this. Wonderful. All right. So, so let's look at how logic models can serve as section. an organizational tool for evaluation planning. So evaluation is required of all NSF ATE proposals, and it's generally just a good practice for all initiatives that want to critically examine their processes and impact. So given the different roles of our participants today, I just want to give a 30 second introduction to evaluation. So evaluation is the systematic determination of a project's quality and effectiveness. An evaluation can help document the pro what the project did and the project's contributions to the larger field. It can also be a really useful tool for project decision making and planning. It can help you get to know what aspects of the project are working well and for whom. So to boil the evaluation process down to its essence, evaluation first starts by asking important questions about a project's processes and outcomes. Then the evaluator and project team gather evidence that will help answer those questions. The evaluation team then interprets the data, making meaningful statements that answer the evaluation questions. And finally, evaluation results are shared back with stakeholders and used for the purposes of accountability, project improvement, and planning. So that's evaluation in a nutshell, asking important questions and gathering data to answer them. So there are a lot of points of intersection between evaluation and logic models. And a big one is that logic models can do a really great job of helping to identify what questions to ask and what data to gather. So to demonstrate how you can use a logic model to identify your evaluation questions, I want to build out an example logic model. So we've talked about logic models in theory today, but I want to look um, a little bit more in depth at an example. So for this case example, we're going to be talking about a hypothetical ATE project called Preparing Educators for Cross-Disciplinary STEM Teams. So a motivator for this project comes from a recently published report by CORD and the Preparing Technicians for the Future of Work project. This report outlines the importance of training cross-disciplinary STEM workers in preparation for changes in future STEM careers. Technicians will need to be able to work in cross-disciplinary teams. The report identifies essential skill areas for associate degree technician programs needed to do this successfully. These 
key skill areas include data knowledge and analysis, advanced data literacy, and business knowledge and processes. This hypothetical project aims to increase the inclusion of these cross-disciplinary STEM content across STEM programs and departments at their college. The project aims to better prepare students for future careers. So let's build a logic model for this case example. So looking at the activities column, this project intends to develop and conduct two-day professional development workshops for faculty at their college. They also want to give 20-minute informational presentations to administrators and faculty in various departments and programs on campus. So these sessions will introduce the idea of cross-disciplinary teams and what is needed in order to change our current instruction to best prepare students for the jobs of tomorrow. So in our short-term outcomes, the project intends to increase the administrator and faculty's understanding of what cross-disciplinary teams are and why they would be important to the future of STEM careers. They also want to increase faculty's skills around incorporating the cross-disciplinary STEM content into their courses. Once administrators and faculty are bought into the importance of teaching students these essential skills, the project wants to see increased inclusion of cross-disciplinary content into courses across the college. And all of these efforts are intended to lead to the long-term outcome that students are better prepared for the future of work and can successfully function in cross-disciplinary teams. So now that we have our example logic model built, let's look at how we can use these columns to identify the questions that we want our evaluation to answer. So looking at our activities, we might wanna ask about whether our project reached its intended, its intended audience. Collecting data around project activities and implementation can give in the moment suggestions for improvement. Therefore, we want to ask questions such as, to what extent were administrators and faculty satisfied with the workshops and presentations? These types of process questions can really help identify opportunities for immediate change. If workshop attendees were truly unsatisfied, that might be something that you'd want to know sooner than later. So since we expect our short-term outcomes to happen first and most immediate after the project activities, this is a good place to find inspiration for evaluation questions. So our short-term outcomes are currently phrased as changes in knowledge and skills. This makes them relatively easy to measure in post-workshop or presentation feedback sessions. Therefore, we might ask questions like, how is the project influencing administrators and faculty's understanding of cross-disciplinary teams? And to what extent is the project influencing faculty skills around teaching the cross-disciplinary STEM content? Asking questions about our midterm outcomes helps to build the case that our underlying project logic is on the right path. So our logic model hypothesized that if administrators and faculty understood more about the cross-disciplinary teams and how to incorporate those skills into courses, that more teachers would then include that content across STEM departments. But is that really happening? So to, to determine that, we'd want to include an evaluation question to learn more about it. Long-term outcomes can sometimes be years away from the initial project activities. This makes it really difficult to adequately capture them within the timeframe of the project or the evaluation. So in this example, it might take faculty two years to integrate cross-disciplinary content into their courses, and then another two years to see students in these courses graduate and really enter the workforce. So measuring whether they're better prepared or whether they do better in those, in those jobs um, might be outside the scope of an ATE evaluation. So one of the strengths of using a logic model approach in your evaluation is that by gathering evidence that supports the general project theory, you can begin to build an argument for even the long-term outcomes that might not be feasible to measure directly. So here we have all of the evaluation questions from our case example lined up. So by using the logic model to inform question development, we're really ensuring that we have some questions about process and other questions about outcomes. So your evaluation should make an argument for the impact and effectiveness of your project, as well as inform opportunities for improvement along the way. Having questions about both process and outcomes will help you do both of these things. So finally, let's look at using your logic model for project management. So too often we see logic models just get filed away once grants are funded, never to be looked at again. 
So just as logic models play a role prior to your grant being funded, there are multiple uses that they can have after you receive your funding. And one of those is project management. So if you've ever found yourself digging through old files or binders or drawers to compile documentation about your project, your logic model is a one-stop shop when it comes to your project activities and outcomes. Everything's summarized on a single page. So sometimes I pin a printed logic model to my wall or even have it on my desk for a quick reference. You can also use logic models to structure project updates during meetings. So you can check in on um, activities as you go along, see how, how they went, whether they were achieved. And the logic model can also form a structure for project reflection and improvement sessions. So you can come together and look at internal and external evaluation data to assess how short-term outcomes are going. You can ask your project team, is your project being implemented the way you anticipated? Are you seeing the changes that you thought you would see? And if not, why? What's different? What changed? What other elements or influences are causing these things to look different? So before we wrap up, I have one more chat question for you. So I know that there are dozens of other ways that people are using logic models after they're funded. So for project management or evaluation purposes or others. So I wanna hear from you, how have you revisited your logic model for project management or evaluation? So you can use the chat window on the right side of your screen to respond. So Susan says that she turned it into a timeline and then used it to track progress, checking items off as they were accomplished. I love that idea, Susan. Emmanuel, you said you've used it for both project management and evaluation. Can you give an example of how you've used it? Yeah, Richard, I, I think you can develop future activities from it as well. I think when I create logic models with clients, they tend to have a lot of ideas and not all of them are feasible within a single grant. And so keeping track of those other ideas or activities or even issues that come up within the project um, theory can really help to uh, brainstorm future project ideas. Yeah, just like Maureen said, building on the logic model as work progresses for future grants, definitely. <laughs> Ours said to keep PIs and project staff from project creep and expanding beyond the original goals and activities. I think that is a great way to frame it. Erica has used it as a timeline, sort of a checklist of deliverables and questions to ask. I love that. And the using it when presenting our work to potential new partners or funder, funders is a communication tool. Yeah, it's such a great way of thinking of it, a communication tool. It really brings everything together in one succinct place. Uh, someone from our web chat the other week actually called it a way to control the chaos. And I thought that that was a great phrase as well. All right, so I think we have one more, oh, one more slide. So logic, just to sum everything up that we've talked about today before our last question break, logic models really are these multi-use tools for project planning, management, and evaluation. So the process of creating a logic model can be really valuable in aligning your project details to your overarching goals. It can also help identify gaps in your project logic and clarify assumptions. A logic model can build understanding, promote consensus among your internal team, as well as among evaluators, grant specialists. Logic models are particularly beneficial in funding proposals as they distill the core purpose of your project for reviewers and help your proposal stand out. The ability to summarize your complex project effectively has multiple applications for your project, both pre and post grant funding. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Emma to introduce our post webinar survey right before our last question break. Interesting. I Yes, so we encourage you to complete our post webinar survey. Anna just launched that, should be showing up on your screen. The survey helps to inform Valuate on how to continually improve our webinar series. We will have a question break coming up, but if you folks can go ahead and fill that out for us, we would really appreciate it. 
All right, so we'll go ahead and leave the survey link up for you. You can go ahead and access that on the left-hand side, but we did have a few more questions come through that I'll go ahead and start having Lissa answer for us. So a question from Michelle, anyone created a logic model for a development evaluation and how has the I don't, experience Michelle, been different? But I would so love Lisa, to hear any more of anyone who that? has that experience. I can think of a few ATE evaluators who are really big proponents of developmental evaluation. And I'm actually writing that down right now because I would love to ask them that question. Uh, maybe we can have them share back in a web chat or write a blog about it because I think developmental evaluation is so useful for so many different types of projects. Um, and yeah, a great question. What does that look like in a logic model and how do you communicate that in a proposal? All right, so the next question I believe came in from Michelle again. I've had clients struggle with LT goals. There, so long-term goals, I believe. There are a few who are scared of the big goals and others with LT goals that are beyond what's captured in the logic model. Wondering how others have dealt with either of these scenarios. I know Matthew did follow up. He said, that's a great question regarding long-term goals. It's hard to write those that are aspirational, but not so broad and I think that's something that a lot of people struggle so, with. Of how so what are your thoughts on long-term goals, goals and um, what Michelle I does? tend to say, if, given that this is a project theory, given that we want to capture the entire purpose and underlying imp intended impact of a project, go big, right? Recognize that you don't have to measure in your evaluation everything that you write down in the logic model. You can say that there are some things that are outside of the scope or range or budget or time frame of your project and of your evaluation. But going big, having those really large intended impacts uh, not that we want to minimize the utility of them, right? I mean, everyone can say that their logic model ends in the world being a better place for everyone. Um, but you want to make sure that you are tying that back, those long-term goals back to the initial need or problem statement of your project. So what was the initial gap or problem or um, what are you responding to and what are you filling? And I think just as long as you're making sure that those long-term goals are speaking back to that larger picture, I think it really helps, particularly if you're using a logic model for, for funding proposals, it really helps reviewers put this into a larger context. Because I, I, something that I say a lot is remember that reviewers are on this panel. They have you know, between five and eight different proposals to review. They're all 15 pages they're fairly long, right? And so your logic model can be a really great way to have your project and its impact stand out. Um, it can be a really great way to distill what those are and clearly communicate what your bigger goal is. And I think that that will speak more directly to a panel of diverse reviewers um, than if you're trying to keep it smaller on the long-term goals because you wanna make sure that it's something that's measurable. And then we have another question for you, Lissa, in from Lacey. Is there a range of research questions we should try to stick to? I think that's a really good question, Lacey. I do want to point out that I, there, there is a difference between research questions and evaluation questions. So we talked about evaluation questions today. So I'm going to assume that that is what you were referring to is evaluation questions. Um, so there's no perfect number of evaluation questions to have within your evaluation plan. Um, I think if you're looking at 15 or 20, that's a little too many, right? You want to make sure that you have these broader um, evaluation questions that maybe have some questions to them. Um, and then tips on how to prioritize them if you have multiple things that you want to measure. I'm going to ask Emma or Anna to look up um, the checklist on writing evaluation questions. Because I think that this resource can be really helpful in a differentiating the difference between research questions and evaluation questions, but also 
um, thinking about how you can make a really meaningful evaluation question. So what does it mean to be evaluative and making sure that it's measurable and realistic? I think sometimes we have all of these things that we would love to measure, but is that realistic within the evaluation, within the data that you have access to? So I, I hope that that was helpful, but I also recognize that I you may be more interested in research questions. So please feel free to follow up with me and we can talk a lot more about that because I think that's could be a whole webinar in of itself. Awesome. So I believe that is all the questions that we had submitted. Um, I believe Anna hopefully is tracking down that resource. If not, I can grab it. Uh, there we go. Just popped into the chat box. Thank you so much, Anna. And so we would encourage you, um, I know Liz has mentioned these a few times throughout the conversation today, but we encourage you to connect with us at, with the ATE evaluation community by joining us at our monthly web chats. Our web chats are small group discussions around various topics each month. You can jump onto our website and register for those. We do have a few remaining in our 2021 year here. Also, we don't want you to hesitate to reach out. Additional support can be found by contacting Evaluate directly. If you need help, we are only a call or click away. We can help answer questions, direct you to resources, or connect you with a coach, so don't hesitate to re reach out. That brings us to the close of our webinar today. We would like to thank you all for participating with us. We hope you will continue to our website and explore additional resources and opportunities with us. With that, have a great day. Thank you so much.